This is Wolf One calling the Amiya science vessel Light of Dawn reflecting off the clouds. If you can hear this transmission, please respond. This is Wolf One calling the Amiya science vessel Light of Dawn reflecting off the clouds. If you can hear this transmission, please. The captain practically leapt at the communications console. This is the Dawn Light. You're speaking with the captain. This is Colonel Carradine of the Wolf League Self-Defense Forces. Please report your status. Are you in immediate need of assistance? Our status is we're all still alive, but we have a lot of pirates on board, the captain answered, trusting the translator to handle the new vocabulary. We're sheltering on the bridge behind reinforced bulkheads, but they're almost through, he checked the monitor. And they're still cutting. Understood. Can you patch me through your internal comms so I can speak to the boarding party? Yes. Hold on. Okay, you're live. This is Colonel Carradine of the WLSDF, Leonids. Your ship has fled and you have no hope of escape. Surrender and you will be given a fair trial. You have two minutes to respond. Carradine out. The captain was watching the internal cameras as Colonel Carradine was talking. The pirates were still busy cutting through the bulkheads, but one of them took a moment to go up to the nearest camera and make a gesture with his right hand. One of the pirates just made a nonverbal signal, the captain reported to Colonel Carradine. A clenched fist with the middle finger raised. Does that mean something? There was a pause, then a sigh. It means we're going to have to do this the hard way. Wolf 2 and 3 will continue to chase their ship. Wolf 1 will come to assist you. How many pirates are left on board? The captain did a quick count on the monitors. 27. Do I have permission to send marines aboard your ship to remove them? The captain brought up the translator's notes. Marines. Specialized ship-borne assault troops. Yes, yes, absolutely. And hurry, they're almost through to the bridge. The captain checked the cameras again. All the pirates who'd been in the cargo bays were converging on the route to the bridge. They've left everything else. They're all coming towards us. Does your ship still have engines? Yes, but only at partial power. Then that's their last hope of escape. That or, well, they may be intending to ram us. Do everything you can to stall them, and if you can't stop them from reaching the bridge, then destroy the controls. Our ETA is now three minutes. Carradine out. The captain looked back at the cameras. The pirates were almost through the last bulkhead. They did not have three minutes. He looked around at the bridge crew. Anyone got any ideas? Barricade the doors, the safety officer said. Use anything that's loose. We don't have to delay them long, just a few minutes. The trouble was, almost nothing on the bridge was loose. Hurriedly, they detached the casings that protected some of the consoles and wedged the panels in front of the door. Well, we may have bought ourselves an extra three seconds, said Luamet. They've broken through the last bulkhead, Kialad announced. There must be something we can use. The captain looked around again, but there was nothing that wasn't solidly fixed to its surroundings. It was agonizing. They were so close, they just needed to buy a little more time. Anything to slow them down. Turn off the lights? Evacuate the air? No, that armor was definitely vacuum-proof, and they must have suit lamps. There was a bunch of exposed wiring on the bridge now. They could start a fire in front of the door. No, the fire suppression system would take care of that. Wait. Safety officer, which console controls the fire extinguishers? Fire extinguishers are fully automated, Kumos answered. But you can access their programming from here. What are you? But the captain didn't have time to explain. He quickly flicked through the menus. Emergency systems, fire suppression, bridge, targeting parameters. He could hear noises outside the door. The bridge was vacuum sealed, but buried in the center of the ship, behind multiple layers of heavy bulkheads. It hadn't been considered necessary to reinforce the access points. You could smash through it with a hammer if you put some effort in, but the pirates probably had something a lot quicker planned. The captain entered the last command, and a hatch in the middle of the ceiling opened. A nozzle extended and started spraying the door with white foam, building up layer after layer. The foam was formulated to be capable of smothering any fire up to and including exposed plasma conduits, and it quickly set hard forming a shell around the affected area. In seconds, the door and the panels wedged around it were covered in a solid white mass. There was a muffled bang, and the foam bulged outwards. 
It glowed with heat for a moment, but the sprayer kept piling on more foam. Then the whole ship shook. Take cover. They're still trying to blast their way in here, the security officer started. No, that wasn't an explosive, the captain said. Look at the external cams. The pirates just ran out of time. The human battleship was alongside them. It had secured the dawn light with grappling hooks, and an armored umbilical had latched onto the airlock that had just been ripped open by the departing pirate ship. The marines were here. It was almost beautiful in a sickening sort of way, like watching a spaceship crash. These two groups of humans were highly trained and well-equipped, performing at the absolute peak of their specialty. It just so happened that what they specialized in was killing each other. The bridge crew got a front row seat to the spectacle, courtesy of the internal cameras. The first Marines through the broken airlock came in firing, but they were still at a disadvantage against the defenders. For the first time, the EMEA got to see the gruesome power of the weapons they'd almost been on the receiving end of. Some kind of projectile thrower rather than an energy beam. From the muzzle flashes, it looked like they used chemical propellants to accelerate small payloads. The trails they left were just visible in the clouds of frozen water vapor drifting through the decompressed corridors. The first Marine to board was ripped apart by several shots at once. The others around him didn't even break their stride. Their thick armor was deflecting a few of the rounds, but another Marine went down, a streak of red torn away from his knee. They were firing back, though. The leading Marine sent a larger projectile spinning down the corridor, which exploded just as it reached the pirates. The explosion didn't kill the four pirates covering the airlock. Their armor was thick enough to protect them. But it made enough of a distraction for the Marines to push through. A Marine went down with a gaping hole in his chest. But in the same instant, one of the pirates fell, helmet split open. Then they were right in amongst each other. A few more shots were fired. Then they abandoned their guns for long knives. Metal flashed, faster than the Amiya could follow. The three remaining pirates fought ferociously, slashing and punching and kicking and weaving around their enemy's blows. A marine fell to his knees as a knife slipped between the joints in his leg armor, and the pirates pressed the advantage. But they were outnumbered. One lunged too aggressively and ended up grappling with a marine who managed to pin his arm and slide a knife into the gap between his neck armor and his helmet. The other two were forced back down the corridor where there was no cover. More marines were moving up, and the melee combat broke apart suddenly. The two remaining pirates were caught in a withering hail of projectiles. Their armor held up for a few more seconds before they were shredded. Luomet had to stop watching at that point, in order to throw up. Akono and Kialad were looking queasy, and although Kumos looked pale around the eyes, the safety officer also seemed like he was mentally taking notes. The captain was sickened by violence too, but he wasn't going to take his eyes off the pirates for one second until he had his ship back. Bridgehead secure, the marines started advancing through the ship. Two pirates stayed behind at the bridge, trying to blast their way through the doors. The other twenty redeployed to meet the marines. The bulkheads offered easy choke points. As soon as the marines reached one and tried to get through the hole cut by the pirates, they were pinned down by incoming fire. The captain felt his feathers stand on end as one Marine dived through the hole only to be immediately shot to pieces. Then he realized there was something he could do to help. Colonel Carradine, I'm opening the bulkheads in all areas not occupied by my crew and passengers. You should now have several routes around the pirates. Understood. Thank you. The Marine's tactics changed instantly. Instead of trying to push through the choke points, they switched to defending them, keeping the pirates occupied while other teams bypassed their positions. From that point on, it was less a fight than a massacre. The pirates had nowhere to hide now. Every position they took, the marines just went around them. Corridor by corridor, section by section, they were forced back, and one by one, they died. They kept fighting, though. The captain didn't know whether to call it bravery or insanity. But their skill and their discipline were incredible. He'd always thought of the human warrior caste as like animals, tearing each other apart with brute ferocity. But they moved more like machines, precise, calculated, utterly without fear. It was amazing and terrifying at the same time. 
A few minutes later, and the pirates were out of places to go. You could trace the course of the battle by following the trail of corpses through the ship. The marines efficiently closed of their escape routes and hunted them down, one by one. Akono stopped watching, then Kiala too. A projectile blew through a pirate's helmet and splattered his brains across the walls, and even Kumos gave up, leaving only the captain still watching the monitors. At last, only two pirates remained. They abandoned their effort to blast their way through to the bridge and drew their weapons. They managed to hold off the marines for another minute before they, too, were finally killed. The captain sat back. It felt like he'd just climbed several miles into the sky and now finally was able to glide. The dawn light was safe. They were all safe. He let himself rest for a moment, but only for a moment. There would be plenty of repairs to make, of course. The marines were already returning to their ship, but thankfully before they left, they cleared away the bodies and did their best to wipe away the blood and gore. The first order of business was to repressurize everything. Once the engineers had suited up, it didn't take them long to repair the broken airlock. After they were done, Colonel Carradine requested permission to meet the captain face to face. The captain accepted, of course, and was only slightly surprised to find that the colonel was already on board. He had led the assault force personally. The captain's first instinct when confronted with the armored giant was to fly away. His second instinct when the helmet came off was, this human is old. He knew enough about humans to know that white hair was a sign of age, and there was a lot of scar tissue snaking across that pink, fleshy face. And a thought crossed his mind that most predators, being animals, do not get to enjoy the benefits of old age. As their experience increases, their physical health declines, and usually they die fairly early and take the wisdom of a thousand successful hunts with them. Humans, however, just keep going. Colonel Carradine, it's good to meet you in person. Thank you for coming to our rescue, the captain said, the ship's translator shadowing his words with a half-second delay. I'm just glad we got here in time. We didn't think they were operating this far out. If our patrol hadn't been extra thorough, well... We've traced six pirate attacks so far, and each time we only found debris. They don't leave witnesses behind. That sent a chill right down to the captain's wingtips. Just who are they, exactly? In fact, could I ask who you are? I'm afraid I don't know much about human political divisions. We're a naval detachment of the Wolf League Self-Defense Forces, formed to defend the League of Colonies of the Wolf 359 system. They are, well, they were, the last remnants of the Leonis self-defense forces. I won't get into the politics, but Leonis recently lost a war for independence. Most of their ships surrendered, but a handful went rogue and started preying on civilian shipping for supplies. That explained why they were taking items that could be easily manufactured. They had nowhere left to go to get even the most basic supplies. The captain couldn't imagine being desperate enough die for some ration packs. So they were just trying to survive? They could have survived by surrendering like they were goddamn ordered to. But some people just don't know when to quit. It's a shame they were good soldiers, but the crews they've killed deserved better too. We've been telling the United Nations for years that this problem wasn't going to go away. Well, all that's done with now. They've gone too far this time. What do you mean? Attack the ships of the Wolf League or the Lalandeans, or the Procyonites. Well, that's the problem of the Wolf League, or the Lalandeans, or... You get the idea. But attack an alien ship? Humanity has had to work very hard to convince the rest of the galaxy we're not monsters, and they may just have undone all that in the space of a few hours. Everyone across the whole of human space will be outraged. If the United Nations Security Council doesn't authorize a task force by the end of the week, I'll be shocked. We'll finally have the resources we need to hunt them down once and for all. Speaking of which, a light was blinking on his comm interface. Could I use your communication systems for a moment? The captain showed him how to patch through to his ship, and Colonel Carradine brought up a video feed. It was coming from one of the other Wolf League ships that had continued chasing the pirate vessel. It looked like they'd finally caught them. They won't surrender, of course. Stubborn to the end, the colonel muttered. The captain wasn't an expert in human body language, 
But the colonel didn't seem like a hunter eager at the prospect of another kill. He seemed subdued, mournful. The pirate ship was firing another volley of missiles. One by one, they were picked off by the pursuer's defenses. Crimson particle beams stabbed out, goring it, sending clouds of atmosphere spilling into the vacuum. Then one struck it just forwards of its engines. For a second, it seemed like it hadn't done anything. Then suddenly, a blossoming explosion broke the pirate ship in two. Secondary explosions rippled along its hull. Then it disappeared in one final, all-consuming fireball. God rest their souls. Not much of a fight, two against one. And I saw you'd already done some damage to them. I'm impressed, by the way. You put up a good fight considering this isn't a warship. When you're desperate, you do what you have to do, the captain replied flatly. And it crossed his mind that maybe the Leonids had thought the exact same thing. Again, I'm sorry you had to do any of this, Colonel Carradine said. And I'm sorry for your loss. We saw that some of your Marines died during the fighting. It's... It's very moving that they would sacrifice their lives for us. If there's any way we could make recompense to their families? The colonel shook his head. That's very kind of you, but those men were just doing the job they'd signed up to do. They died for their comrades and their colonies, and to have their service remembered is all they ask for. Besides, we're the ones who owe you. We should have stopped the Leonids long before things got to this point. We'll remain here with you while you make repairs, then we'll escort you out of local space. Have your engineers let us know what your repair schedule will be, and if there's any way we can assist, then please, don't hesitate to ask. Thank you. But don't feel you're obliged to. We don't hold you responsible for the actions of the pirates. The captain wasn't entirely sure the Amiya's governmental bodies would echo that view, but the colonel had just had several of his friends die trying to save them. Plus, the captain thought it would be a good idea to stay on friendly terms with the person who'd had three warships close by. It's not just a matter of obligation. It would be better for all of us if you made it back to Amiya space safely. The war with the Kalu Kamsku was a terrible tragedy. The last thing we want to do is fight another bunch of aliens over a misunderstanding. We had one very close call today. I'm not going to take any risks of something worse happening. The look on his grizzled face made it clear he wasn't open to negotiation on this. The chances of further pirate activity in this system are remote, but there's always the possibility that the ship that attacked you had partners that'll come looking for it. In any case, it's a moot point. We'll have to stay for a while. Wolf One needs significant repairs. Oh, I'm sorry, I wasn't aware. I didn't see you take any damage during the battle. We didn't. But coming into the system at FTL like that almost tore the ship apart. When you do wake riding like that, the lead ship always has a hard time. Wolf 1 won't be going anywhere for a while. Wake riding? I'm sorry, my translator isn't familiar with the term. When you need to enter a solar system at FTL, if you have more than one ship, you can position one in front and use its wake to smooth out the passage for the other ships. A bit risky, but as you said, when you're desperate, you do what you have to do. The captain didn't know what to say to this. With decades of spacefaring experience behind him, he understood the physics behind wake riding, but it was insane. You'd lose the lead ship at least, well, 20% of the time, probably. The Wolf League ships really must have been desperate to get there in time to save them. Or humans just had a very different concept of what constituted an acceptable risk, which would make sense because it seemed like these particular humans got shot at for a living. The captain was torn between being impressed by their courage and the lengths they'd gone to save him and his crew, and the sobering realization of just how alien these people were. Not that he really needed any more evidence for that. It took them several days to repair the Dawnlight fully. Several days with the three Wolf League ships holding position around them. A lot of the geologists wanted the captain to tell the humans to go away. The ground grubbers were a nervous sort, probably the result of not getting enough air on a regular basis. Still, the captain could see their point of view. It made him a little nervous, too, after all that had happened, having so many humans nearby. But if the humans wanted them dead, they'd be dead already. After all that had happened, that was very clear. As far as the captain was concerned, 
They were lucky the Wolf League ship staying because no one, absolutely no one, would dare come near the Dawnlight while they were there. Until now, the Amiya had considered humans as little more than a curiosity. Dangerous? Perhaps to less sophisticated species like the Kalu Kamsku, but humans were far away and technologically backward. Not really anything the Amiya had to worry about. The Dawnlight was a state-of-the-art ship, but if the Wolf League hadn't arrived in time, then it would have been so much debris scattered across the system. The humans were genuinely apologetic. He'd had the chance to talk to several of the engineers on the human ships as they were making repairs. And they weren't just concerned with what would happen to humanity's reputation when the Dawnlight reported what had happened here to the rest of the Amia. They seemed, well, embarrassed and ashamed that fellow humans had attacked a completely neutral and undefended ship. And eager to make up for it by helping out with the repairs, the Amiya engineers weren't entirely comfortable with that at first, but after a few days they actually started to develop a rapport. The captain had a feeling that this incident was going to be passed off as a misunderstanding by the higher-ups. None of the Amiya had died, after all, and the humans were very sorry. Easier to just put it down to a handful of criminals and forget about it. The Amiya were happier ignoring the humans. And sure, he didn't want them to overreact. The last thing he needed was to be known as the captain who triggered a major diplomatic incident. After dealing with Colonel Carradine and his subordinates for a few days, it seemed like the majority of humans were perfectly reasonable people. But no matter how much he wanted to forget the whole incident, there was one thing the captain couldn't get out of his mind. Not the fact that they'd been seconds away from death although he definitely wasn't going to forget that anytime soon. No, the thing that he kept thinking about every time he thought of the humans was the ruthless efficiency with which the Wolf League's marines had hunted down their Leonid enemies. Humans killed humans. From what the captain knew of their evolutionary history and their culture, it seemed like that was what they were born to do. And until they learned to stop doing it, there was always going to be the chance that the violence would spill over onto anyone else who happened to be nearby. They had the potential to be good friends, if the Wolf League forces were anything to judge by, but they clearly also had the potential to be horrifying enemies. At some point, the Amiya were going to have to start taking the humans seriously. The captain didn't know how long that would take, but right now, at the very least, they were going to have to add a new word to their lexicon pirate. Hopefully they would never have to learn the human word for war.